This is Deep Natter. Last week, I was talking to Martin Rotz, who you've heard us mention several times on the show. And I was asking him how he manages to stay so creative. His answer not only surprised me, but it inspired me to adopt a similar approach to my own creativity in an experiment I'm doing for the month of June. Talking it through with Sean launched us into a terrific discussion around making and self-care and what he calls turning down the bullying boss. Here we go. I wanted to tell you about this. I, I had a talk with Martin the other day, Martin Rotz. Oh, yeah. We have pointed to Martin as kind of one of the most creative people that that we know, especially during lockdown. He hasn't slowed down a bit. Oh, yeah. He's a madman. Yeah. And I asked him, do you come at this intentionally? Do you just sort of back into these projects? Are you just going through uh, practice and exercise? Like, how, how, are you, how are you managing to stay creative and challenging yourself with these projects, regardless of what's going on in the world? Mm. And he said, you know, I've simplified everything. And I'll let him tell the story because he's going to be a guest host next week when you're off in Italy enjoying yourself at the villa. Hmm. Sunning myself at the villa. He That's right. Me in the swimming pool with an Aperol spritz in hand. Yeah. Enjoying grapes by the pool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, I won't. I won't give too much of it away. But but the the short version of it is is he simplified and he said, look, I, I have a list of things that I have to do during the day, and they have nothing to do with being creative. I eat breakfast. I meditate. I read. I exercise. And those are pretty much the things that I have to get done. Mm -hmm. And everything else comes out of those things. And I, and I was like, you mean kind of as a byproduct of that? I mean, as, as just sort of taking care of yourself, right? Putting your energy into self-care allows creativity to come out. And he said, pretty much, yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of how it works. And man, that just, that just knocked me over. I was like, wow, that's... Putting self-care first. Hmm. What a novel idea. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more of this. <laughs> I go on. So, uh, you know, we talked a little bit more and I said, I, I kind of love that. And this was just a couple of days ago. And I thought, you know what? This is great. This is great. This is a new month. It's June. I'm going to try this for a month. I'm going to try not to be creative. I'm going to try to not consci to consciously not be creative for the month of June. And I'm going to put self-care first. So I've, I've adopted these same four things, breakfast, exercise, reading, and meditation or yoga. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that I have to get done. And he, and he said, the great thing about a simple list is you get that either real or imagined feeling of completion when you can check something off. Yeah. And that acts as fuel, as motivation to continue throughout the day. You find yourself, even these little wins are enough to be fulfilling in some way. Mm. And I thought, how great is that? You know, because I, I don't know how this works for you. We've talked about it a little bit, but on a day to day, I feel an intense pressure, self-imposed to be sure. I mean, nobody's, you know, knocking on my door going, you have those paintings ready. No, I mean, nobody's doing that. Yeah. But I feel a self-imposed pressure to make, whether it's writing whether it's recording with people, finding people that I want to record with and reaching out to them, whether it's painting, whatever it is, I feel this self-imposed pressure to make. Mm. And with Martin's method, with his approach, rather, you take that pressure off of the making and let it become almost a reward in a way for just taking care of yourself. And I kind of love that. I mean, it's, I, I kind of talk about it in the book. Mm -hmm. um, from the point, it's a slightly different angle. Cause I think, I think the genius of what Martin's saying is like so many of us get stuck in the making process because of the pressure we put on ourselves to make the thing. It, it becomes like paralyzing and then like we become our own like dictatorial bosses. Right. And, 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 and like for somebody, it's so stupid, but like it, it does kind of work. Like for somebody like me, I've never worked very well in another company because I don't deal with authority well. Right. But I also don't <laughs> right. deal with authority well when it comes from me. 
I'm not you know photographing I mean? your sofas, man. Yeah, well, I mean, you <laughs> should have been fly on the wall for some of those conversations because, <laughs> like, because guys, can we try a different angle maybe on this? You know, just on this thumbnail of a sofa and a wipe. No, this is how it's been done. I think you just want to beat your head against the wall. You know? Right, right. But, but I also don't respond well to 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 me bullying me. You know, right. Not just other people bullying me. That and where where this comes out for me specifically is like. If I go out to take photographs on a day, going like, I really have to produce some imagery today. And I, I pack gear and I go out with intention and I take the camera out and I, I walk the streets for hours and I've got my camera in hand and I'm ready looking for photographs. I'm getting anxious. I need to find photographs and then beating myself up because I can't find photographs and, and I'm no good anymore. If I do that, I don't get anywhere almost every time. But if I say to myself, and I play this trick with myself, if I say to myself, I'm going to go out today and just go for a walk in York because it's a lovely day. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to take my camera because it's always with me. And I have my little Ricoh GR3X. So, I mean, it's, it's in my bag always, you know, so I know it's there. But I'm not telling myself I have to produce imagery. I'm just going for a walk because I love that. And I know mm -hmm. I'll enjoy that. 100%, that's a simple thing on a checklist that I'll definitely, definitely enjoy. I know myself. I'll round a corner. And see some interesting light. And I'll pull the camera out of my bag because I want to. Not because I'm bullying myself to. Right, right. But because I want to. And I, I almost feel like what Martin's doing is like, and what will probably happen for you, I'm going to guess, is when you give yourself a simple checklist of things that you actually like doing, you could probably throw, I'm going to take Cooper for a walk on that list because you mm -hmm. just love doing that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and if you do those simple things that you love doing, at some point you're going to wander down to the basement. Because you had an idea while you were just doing other stuff. Right. And then you might just try something because you, you want to, not because you feel you have to. And then you'll find yourself there three hours later going, gosh, I had so much fun today. And yeah. it's almost like tricking yourself into the making and, and turning down the bullying boss inside you that makes you do that, which just robs you of joy. And for me, it robs you of inspiration as well, I think. I think it absolutely throws water on inspiration, like it quenches it. I agree. I, I can look at work that I tried, quote unquote, to do versus work that just came out. And I can tell you which paintings were which. Yeah. I can tell you which pieces of writing were which, which, which ones that I feel like I had to get out versus which ones I feel like I crafted. I can, I can tell you exactly which ones are which just by reading them. I, I remember like writing the book. I, whenever I go back over the book, I, I remember which sections flowed out really easily in a day because I, I tricked myself into doing it and just enjoyed it. When I, when I used to write songs in a band, the best songs I wrote happen be, because I, I, I didn't sit down to write a song. I just started messing around with something and 20 minutes later I had a song. You know, those were always the best rather than me going, geez, we need another song. And I'd rack my brains for a week and come out with crap. Yeah, It's just... There's something about tricking yourself into making or by doing other stuff or by just taking the pressure off completely and going, I'm just here to have fun today. It doesn't really matter what comes out. And it, it, it's almost like every single time something better comes out. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, you and I have talked about it several times where those ideas happen when you're in the shower, when you're on a walk, when you're driving to or from work, when you're out with friends and my weakness, one of my weaknesses, there are many to be sure, but one of my weaknesses is not having a journal with me at all times mm -hmm. to write down some of these ideas or, or not yeah. hitting the record button on audio memos on my phone or my watch yeah. or something to capture these things. I think to myself, and I don't know why I do this because I'm proven wrong all the time. Oh, I'll remember it when I get home. Mm -hmm. but of course I don't. You know, and I ask Adrian or I'll call you and go, hey, remember that thing I was telling you about? I didn't write it down. What was that? You know, I don't know. I can't keep up with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think two things need to happen. One, I need to allow myself to let go of that bullying boss and also make the effort to carry my little field note journals with me at all times and just jot things down. They don't have to be pretty. They're not for anyone else. Um, so th that's, that's my goal for, for June. And I'm, I'm really eager to see how it kind of comes out. And I actually jumped the gun because I started the list yesterday and, you know, I got up and I was excited and I, I, you know, did my, my morning workout and took the dog for a walk and came in and made oatmeal and, and man, I just felt better. Even just those little things, I felt better. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Okay, can I read you something from the book? Yes, please. I just found it now because I, I think it like links to it. it. Might help as well. So at the moment, like to put it to to because this all links together. Like I'm I'm busy packing for this retreat, uh, which uh, we leave on Friday, um, and it's going to be a week in in Tuscany. And the, the whole point of this is for a group of creative people to get away, not to make stuff, mm-hmm. to to step outside of things and to simplify things back to. We're just going to wake up every day and have food and have conversations and go visit some towns. And think about our lives and what we want to do and say. But we're not trying to make stuff. We're not here to bully each other or ourselves. We're just here to to take that step back. And for me, it's like it come it, it comes down to like the, the example I use is like this breathing in, breathing out metaphor. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like what you're doing is you're learning to take the in breath. So I'll, I'll read you this little bit. It's from like the, the third chapter. It's just called breath. And it says making things is like breathing in and singing out. If the voice is the work we put out into the world, the column of air is the fuel we need to produce it. One of the biggest quests as artists is to try and work out what our unique voice should sound like and what we uniquely have to say. But so often we forsake the in-breath we need to support that sound. So our creative voices come out as thin and reedy. We will get to working out what the unique creative voice is in the next chapter. But first, we have to spend some time on the oft-neglected but crucial in-breath. Some common complaints I hear, I love to make things, but I just don't know what to make. I bought a camera, but I don't know what to take photographs of. I want to write short stories, but I have no idea what they should be about. The thing, I I think the simple answer for the lack of direction or motivation is that we're trying to speak without first taking a breath. We have to learn to put first things first. This isn't a problem confined to the beginners amongst us either. Veteran artists of many years can still regularly hit that point where they have all the skill and experience necessary to create beautiful things, but no idea what to point those abilities at. Like the air we breathe, we need to draw in our energies, our message, our ideas, even our motivation to make new things. The word inspiration is an interesting one when you break it down. It comes to us fairly unaltered from the Latin word inspiratio, which literally means drawing in a breath or being breathed into by the divine. The Greeks used the word pneuma, which did double duty as a word both describing spirit and breath. The Stoics in particular used the word to describe the life-giving, animating spirit or creative force within human beings. In the same way, a derivative of our English word spirit hides in the middle of our word for breathing, respiration. Language links like this betray the notions that human beings for thousands of years seem to have intuited a connection between creativity, inspiration, spirit, and a divine inbreathing. The Greeks even went so far as to anthropomorphize this creative source in the form of the muses, suggesting that all creative flow came from this pantheon of goddesses with names like Calliope, the muse of epic poetry, Euterpe, the muse of music, and Talia, the muse of comedy. These ideas have carried over into our modern day as well in a number of guises. I remember when I was working for the church that it was common parlance to suggest that you were guided by the Holy Spirit when writing a song or delivering a sermon. Even in secular culture, artists have adopted flesh and blood human beings as their tangible muses, people who have become regular subjects for their paintings, poems or songs. These artists suggest that their work gains a vitality from the transfer of energy, spirit, or pneuma simply because they spend regular time in the presence of their chosen muses. I suppose what all this suggests to me is that when we make, we are looking to be inspired, inspired, breathed into, in order to receive everything we need to create. How many times have we sat sat staring at blank canvases and blank pages, frustrating that frustrated that nothing seems to be flowing, wondering if the muses have forsaken us? Is it maybe because we're trying to speak out before taking in a deep breath? And then I basically go on in that chapter to talk about that deep in breath is whatever it takes for you to disconnect from the thing that you're making and to create generative mental space for yourself. So for me, it's going for a long walk. Just quietly, just going for how simple is that as a thing to do? You know, it comes back to what you said earlier, why we get our best ideas in the shower, because we disconnect. We're taking a breath in. It's it's reading things we love to read. It's watching the films we love. It's taking in art that really gets us fired up and animated before we go and bully ourselves in the studio to make another thing. We forget the breathing in. And I think daily practices like I just need to wake up, make a coffee, have breakfast, take Cooper for a walk. Those are, the, those are in-breath. That's breathing in. Mm-hmm. That's like taking the in-breath. And we we so often don't do that, like just disconnect, create that generative mental space. Because 
all your best ideas happen when you're on a walk, don't they? I mean, or, or in the shower or somewhere else. It doesn't happen when you're staring at the canvas. It happens when you're doing something else and it's just churning away in your subconscious in the back of your mind. Then the ideas flow. And I think that's how inspiration works is we have to create that space where it can kind of happen. This is going to sound like a shameless plug, but hmm. you just heard Sean read a bit from his book. And if you have yet to purchase this book, I can't, I mean, this has nothing to do with the fact that we're friends. This has nothing to do with the fact that, <laughs> that, that I love and respect him. It is a fantastic book and you don't have to believe me. You can look at reviews, go ask people who have read it other than me, and they will tell you the same thing, that it is a beautiful, beautiful book. And I know that if you pick up a copy of this, you will get something out of it. Um, I, ca I can't recommend it enough. So if you don't have a copy of this book, please pick up a copy. That's so kind. Thanks. I genuinely didn't do it for a plug, but that's really sweet of you. I really appreciate it. I know you did. Yeah, and a, that's, that's why a, I did that because I knew you wouldn't. Yeah, yeah no, I definitely wouldn't. <laughs> Go pick it up today. No, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. Um, yeah, I, I, it, it is though, isn't it? It's, it's funny. This, this, uh, the, the last couple of days, um, Sarah and I went down to Revo Abbey, which is down the hill here. Mm -hmm. Um, which if you, if you Google, just, just the it, Abbey down the hill, just that it well, just... <laughs> it's, it's, it's the, the ridiculous Come thing on. is it's one, it's one of like eight within 10 oh miles of here that are like these huge old ruins, but it was fascinating walking around because we picked up these audio guides, which you sort of walk around at different points. You listen to what was going on and the, the monks knew this, like we're talking like these, these abbeys were set up in like the 1100s, 1200s, you know, hmm. and the monks knew this It's like, they had this this very structured but very simple daily life. You know, they, they woke up at particular hours, they had particular services, they, they ate meals together at particular times, they, they did just manual stuff, like they'd make things. You know, some of them would make mead, which is this like, you know, liqueur made from honey that they'd sell. Some would, would you know, garden the, 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 the grounds or whatever. Some would make, you know, carpentry or whatever for the local village. They'd do practical things. But there was no dead space in the in the day in a way but they knew how to how to just like have this do the the very simplest things possible and then be i mean in their case obviously they were looking to be divinely inspired and then mm -hmm. to to connect with god that was their particular thing but i think it's the same principle for everybody if you give yourself that simple list you know it's it it unlocks a bunch of stuff because because it's 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 almost where the Protestants messed us up. You know, you get this idea of like the the Protestant work ethic, you know, which leads to to capitalism in its current form, which is just blood, sweat and tears. You know, it's kind of the Industrial Revolution stuff. All that stuff really messed us up, I think. It yeah. turned us into to machines in a factory that, that, that now that thinking seeps into how we do art as artists. We're, we're machines in a factory. We go down there, we produce, we do stuff, and then it succeeds, and we put it out in the world, and it just, it's just A leads to B, and that's how it works. But there's no space in any of that. Mm -hmm. How could you get brilliant new ideas unless you're some kind of genius? You're not making space for it. Like, I think we used to be much better at doing the simple things and creating the space. And then when you make something, I think you use your time much better because you're full up. You know, you're full up with ideas and inspiration and things you want to put down on a page or a canvas or play on an instrument. But if you don't create that space before, you're just coming like, uh, because the example I use at the beginning of that chapter I read is, is I used to struggle with, with, uh, with singing when I joined this music and drama group out of high school, because my voice used to crack a lot. You know, I was, I was one of those teenagers had a rough few years where right. it was like, you were, you were the Peter Brady of your high school. I was, <laughs> I'm sure I was. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, and it's obviously humiliating, but I spoke to the scene coach and I said, this happens. I hate it. And he's like, all he said to me, he's like, you're not supporting the note that you're singing with a proper column of air. And he taught me how to breathe, not how to sing, how to hmm. take in a, a, a deep enough column of air that when I sang out, it came out stronger and, and, and better able to hold itself. And that, that really stuck with me. Like, if we don't learn how to create space by doing the simple things well and creating generative mental space for ourselves where our subconscious minds can go to work, we don't take the breath in. And when it, if we try to sing out, it comes out as reedy or our voice cracks. It's, we make false steps because we're running on empty the whole time. And I think we feel guilty for creating that space often. But I, I think it's every good artist should have that balance of both. You know, the, agreed that the singing out, the breathing in it has to all be there and e in equal measure or, or you're going to you're not going to make it. You're yeah. going to produce crap.
Well, and you, you hit you said something just now that I I couldn't agree with more. We feel guilty for not making the space. We or we feel guilty for trying to make that space because that it's that's sort of like the admin work on your website or or <laughs> yeah. the, you know it's it needs to be done. It's an important part of the process and needs to be done, but it's not as flashy as you know adding a new gallery of images or mm. uh uh you know putting in a new slider uh mm -hmm. you know whatever um and i i think that well i know that i have experienced the same thing where i i know that there's some back end work that needs to be done but i don't i don't look at that work as in the same way that i look at paint touching a canvas or yeah. or you know words on a page it's not the same thing for me and yet it is exactly the same thing because it all counts as my wife is so fond of pointing out it all counts and i think it is a matter of kind of retraining ourselves and getting away from that sort of hamster wheel of productivity mm. that we have come to rely on and think of the only value and measure of our work yeah exactly it's it's get, it's getting that out of our heads, and it's really hard because I mean I I only say that because I struggle with that guilt. Mm -hmm. You know I I I I know I know when I'm struggling to work out what I'm doing next. The answer is not to try and do it; it's to go do something else instead for a while. Yeah, yeah, and to and to let it, let whatever's going on inside me percolate for a bit. It's why I've got a list of 150 video ideas on my on my Google Docs to make videos to make. Yeah. Most of them I can't make yet because I'm, I think I have the idea of something to say, but I haven't lived enough to have the content for it yet, you know? And, and if I don't go out and do the living and the, the thinking and the reading, then I won't have anything to say. If I just go straight to the doing of that video, it will be empty. It will be right. vacuous rubbish that I spew just to fill a, 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 an imaginary YouTube timetable I've given myself. And so again, no, that's not ready yet. I have yeah. to, I have to read some more. I have to spend some time thinking about it more, but because when I make it, it will be 10 times stronger. And is that, that, that is what I'm meant to be doing. But it's this, we, this bullying timetable we give ourselves. And, and do you see that? Do you, do, I know you, I know you say that. And I, I, I imagine I know the answer to this, that you do see it, but do you see that it is worth the wait? It is worth the living to, to bring more to bear to that work? hundred percent. Yeah. Every time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, every time I make a video, uh, there, there have been a few times, I think, where I've made a video before I knew it was ready to go, where I'm like, yeah, but I just kind of need to get one out. And I know I need to do more thinking about this, but you know, I've got enough to say, most people will be happy with it, but I know it could have been so much better if I left it. And I know when there are times when like, you know, I've lived this one, this is mm -hmm. strong. Like mm -hmm. there was a video I put out a couple of years ago called the two halves of your creative journey. Right. That video probably took 10 years to make, like not in, not the video, but I had to live for 10 years to work out what that stuff meant because yeah. I didn't understand it. Yeah. But it's so profound and that it's not my idea. It's why I can say it. You know, it's not like it's my genius ideas. It's me. <laughs> sharing oh, come on. A little bit of it is. <laughs> no, it's, it's like, it, you know what it is? It's 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 young psychology um, via. Uh, Richard Raw's, um, uh, t take a shot. It, yeah, right. I, was, I didn't want to stuff. interrupt you, but I was going to say no, no, drink. No, no. <laughs> take a shot. Uh, Richard Raw's book, Falling Upwards, yeah. which came, which came at me, uh, in 2008 when I was leaving the church and then having to go through all of that falling apart and picking myself up and realizing this is a pattern in life that happens over and over again if you pay attention to it, and it's forwards, not backwards. That took me 10 years to live through, and a lot of pain, a lot of confusion, a lot of mess, mm -hmm. to find the truth of that for myself. I could just have repeated Jung's theory on that video. Yeah, but, but it wouldn't have been accessible times, to anybody no. relative well, to the well, way you did present it. It would have been dry, academic like I might as well wear a tweed jacket and stand up twiddling a mustache at the front of a lecture hall. It would have felt like a lecture. But, and even though I didn't tell a lot of my backstory with that concept, like I didn't tell people about the church and all the rest of it that I've been through with that, with that and why it made sense to me, but I didn't have to, because I think by living that stuff, it comes out in the way you say things and it has right. so much more weight to it and believability to it and gravitas and vulnerability to it because you lived it. And I think that's, 
If you don't make the space to do that kind of stuff, you just make a dry video that you haven't really lived. I mean, let's be honest. Most of the stuff on YouTube, for example, is people going, what what works? What stuff do people like? I'll tell them that stuff again. Mm -hmm. You know. Whereas most of the stuff you get told hasn't been lived by them. They're just repeating what someone else says that they heard that sounds quite clever. Right. I, I understand, but I think it's so much more powerful if you find the things you have actually lived. And even if you like found a clever idea, go like, hang on a minute. Is this clever because it's someone else's clever idea? Or have I tried to put this into practice and it's meant something? And if not, maybe give it some time and live it out first. Right. And then say it five years from now. And I promise you it'll 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 smash then because it comes from a human being who paid for that knowledge. Mm-hmm. They didn't just they didn't just say what someone else so, said. You know? Go back for a second. What is what is your sort of internal um almost litmus test? to know when you're ready to put something out, when you're ready to put either a concept or a framework or an ideology, when you're ready to talk about that, what, how, how much living is enough living before you're willing to share that and talk about it? Is, is there kind of a concrete litmus test or do you just know when you know? I don't know. It, it's, it's sort of, what I often do with those videos, it, it, and it's by the way, the same process I use for, for, for giving messages or sermons in the church was I, I would write out the concepts for things, Mm -hmm. but, but every concept, this is a rule I had back when I was preaching sermons is any, any concept I wanted to teach, I had to have a story as an application. I had to, because it's not, it's not good enough to just give a, a, like an ivory tower concept without grounding it in a real world story. Right. So then you're just reading off a spreadsheet or something. Yeah. And a a lot of people do it. A lot of people do it because I think vulnerability is something that costs. And I think most people would like to just be praised for a clever idea they found than to tell you where it hit and hurt them and how they pulled themselves out of it. But Mm -hmm. one is much more powerful than the other. And I think what I would do is often, and I've got stuff like this, I've got scripts that are like, you know, a third written where I've written out the concept and what I think it means and how I think it applies. And then when I start to get to the, how am I going to apply this? I realize I haven't really got a story to apply this and then i know it's not ready you know Mm. but if i'm like oh i could tell about this thing that happened to me that so i'll I'll give you a very concrete example so i've got i've i've uh, I've been very productive this week i've managed to get up uh two videos which were were, were sort of preloaded so when i go away i don't have to do any work there's two videos ready to go the first is just a video on black and white conversions which is you know a bit of a tutorial the second one is a video called something like um i can't the exact title i've given it but something like why you're not the best judge of your work and i it's something that i've been thinking about for a long time you know i i don't always know my own work best Mm. and when i see other people posting their their work as well i'm like he doesn't know what his best photos are it's funny we did an exhibition a few years back and some of the people who gave us their images for the exhibition when I looked at the images they chose to go up in that exhibition and looked at the rest of the body of their work, I'm like, you don't know what your best images are. You're a terrible editor of your own work. Right. And it's, it wasn't just me and my own subjective opinion. There were a bunch of us choosing these images. and We were all looking at this going, wow, this person really doesn't know what their best work is. And I, and I had to admit, I fall into that category as well. So I had this idea, like, you're not always the best judge of your own work. So I started writing that down and wrote a few paragraphs about this idea, you know, why, if I make it, am I not the best judge of the things that I make? And what's the strong work? What's the weak work? What's the work that speaks? I thought, I don't really have an example of why that's true. So I left it. Um, and then, and this was, this would have been, January 2020. So we hadn't gone into lockdown yet. Then we went into lockdown and I started writing the meaning in the making. And I had this process where, you know, I, I'd finished the writing by the end of that year. By December, I pretty much locked down the text. And my friend Vla was helping me do the layout and the cover design for the book. And I'd given him ideas for, um, you know, Hey, maybe something Kintsugi based because it kind of fits the vibe of the book, right? Or, right. or maybe maybe something like uh, there was a cool um, sketch Rembrandt did of himself at an easel, which was like really sketchy. So maybe some kind of sketchy cover incorporating one of his sketches would look quite cool. It would fit the thing because I talk about him in there. Um, and Vla, bless him, said to me, "Oh yeah, those are cool ideas." And then he said to me, "Well, what about that shot of the girl on the bridge that you took?" 
And I'm like, I have no idea which one you're talking about. He had to send me a link to my own image, which is now you know, <laughs> the cover. Like, I'm like, yeah, he's, I'm like, I have no idea which one you're talking about. So he sent me the link to this image and I looked at it, I thought, nah, you don't understand like that image, like it's not that good. And uh, on, on that day we, we were, you know, Josh and I were down in town and it was the extinction rebellion protests and the bridges were blocked off and there were like loads of people around. It was such a frantic thing. And honestly, we were running to Westminster square because there are arrests taking place. And I just saw her standing there. Like, and I just sort of pulled the camera up and I took one shot. I hardly stopped running. I, like it was a, it was a, I stopped for a step snapped a shot wasn't even sure the exposure were right and kept on running it's it's kind of a grab shot I, I wouldn't make a good cover and then we carried on and i i made him get working on those other covers like ah, there's definitely something in there's definitely something in this. and like a month later i'm pulling my hair out going none of this is working i don't know why and like he's he's a saint man he just said to me can i can i put this image back in front of you you know the one with the girl on the bridge and i, I suddenly saw it you know like oh yeah it's perfect isn't it and I couldn't see it. What I couldn't changed? see it when he first... Well, this is what I thought. Like, this is the, see, this is the stuff. Like, I think what changed was I, I saw that image in the context of the day that I shot it. So what you can't see in that image is she's surrounded by hundreds of people, but they're not in the shot because mm. she was just in a little spot on herself. I remembered all the people around and the noise and there were drums going off and it was hectic and it was kind of a grab shot. I didn't like how I took it because it was so quick and I couldn't see it for what it was if you saw it for the first time and didn't know any of that context. It was all wrapped up in this welter of noise and chaos of that day. I, I hadn't separated it. Hmm. And, and that's that's what stood center stage for you was all the chaos around it, not yeah. the photograph itself. Yeah, it, okay. It definitely colored it at least yeah. Yeah. for me, so that I couldn't see how peaceful it was. Because he said to me, we talked about it. He said, "Well, I, di I didn't know any of that. I, to me, it looks like the the light's really soft and passy. I thought it might have been like an early morning. She was just standing there looking to the bridge. You got the house, and I could kind of see it more. Then you like seeing hmm. what someone sees in it for the first time." And and so that ended up being the cover image. Now I can I can I could go back to that script where I was going. You're not the best judge of your own work. Now I have a story to land that plane. Sure. You know. Yeah. Sure. And so now I can write that script, and now I know it's ready, and I can make the video, and now it'll go out in a few weeks. Is is? It, it, I but I, I I had to live that first. So I I had that script, that idea before I had any way to land it. I just knew it was true. I know it's true that we're not always the best judge of our own work, but I didn't know why it was true personally in a way that I could communicate because it was my own story too. Right. Now I had that story after that a year later, I had the story and now I could write it and I could put it out. You know, that that's when I know it's ready is when I can apply it personally in a way that's meaningful and pe because then people can connect to it. You know, they can like latch onto it. And, and, and I learned that from having to talk about, you know, spirituality and God and things you can't see to teen distracted teenagers, you know, mm -hmm. you, you better find a way to land that plane. Because yeah. they are going to glaze over in seconds if you start talking about like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and then gone. Jesus they're, said, yeah, yeah exactly. they're be like, I mean, yeah, let's turn to the book of Matthew. You know, yeah. They're already gone. <laughs> if you don't find a way to land that plane, right. it's just good communication. And I, I've always had it. But, the, but, but it is true of everything else, isn't it? It's like it's true for your paintings. I don't feel like the paintings are very personal to me. And, and maybe that's what I've been struggling with. Mm. I don't, I, I, they're, 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 they are representative of things that I'm interested in, but they don't mm -hmm. tie to a particular story. Right. They don't tie to a particular personal narrative. And in that way, I wouldn't call them empty, but it's not far off. Well, I disagree with that at a point because I, th I think those paintings are very you. Hmm. I feel like, I feel like we get a window into your your personality. It's a window into your concern about the world. And it's saturated with that. And that's, that's an interesting, that's good. Yeah. That's an interesting take. I hadn't really thought about, I, when, when I say personal, I'm thinking more in terms of what you just described of something that I've story, lived. Yeah. Well, but I, I don't want to make that too literal either, because I think like a lot of people would try and apply that to their work and go, I don't really want to tell stories about my life. It, it's not, it's not about necessarily telling literal stories from your life and your work. It's about how much of me can I inject into this work that I'm sharing something of myself and what I see and what I care about. And it can be quite, I think it can be quite abstract, obviously in some art forms, very abstract, mm -hmm. but it's just working out how do I, how do I put myself in the arena as, you know, the Roosevelt, Brené Brown stuff. How do I put myself in the arena and not be detached right. from it? 
Well, and I, I think for me, that's where something like Blue is the Collar stands very strong. Yes. And exploring this idea of blue collar workers in America as as an extension, as an homage, as a, a connection to my own family history. Yeah. Something you care about. I mean, it's not 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 just on a personal level with your family history, but also that you you care about and admire those sorts of people. Yes. And you care about audio and good storytelling and good interviewing. It's it's all there in there. Like there's a lot of you in that without you having to literally tell your family story, although you may choose to do that. Yeah. There's a lot of you in there. And and only you can lead us into that stuff because that's in you. It's not it's not borrowed from somebody else's interests or personality. It's yours. Yeah. And you're the best person to take us in there. And maybe, maybe, maybe what we're talking about as well, the best way for you to start that project is to trick yourself into it. Like we were saying is like, just have a recorder on you. And when mm-hmm. you have those conversations that you can't help but have every day, because I've been around you, like that's <laughs> just who you are. Right. Say, do you mind if I just record this? I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing some research. I'm doing, I'm potentially turning it into a project and just start like that, trick yourself into it going, I don't have to record conversations today, but I'm going to have them. And I might just ask if I could turn this on and see if they're all right with that. And, and I, you probably have a ton before you knew it, you know, cause it's just, it's just, you're not bullying yourself into making it. Right. I, yeah. you know, and I was thinking about this the other day. In fact, Adrian and I were talking about it and I, my roadblock that I threw up because I don't know if you know this, but I, I, I do throw up roadblocks for myself. Uh, I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I won't hear it. <laughs> the roadblock I threw up was, was around audio quality. And I, and uh-huh, I go, gosh, uh-huh. I can't guarantee that it's going to be, that it's going to sound good. And are people going to forgive that even mm. though it's sort of in situ on the, it's, but mm. when I think about that further, that can also work against me because it ruins or taints the spontaneity that would occur mm. just just having this initial conversation with someone. And and you're right, you've seen it happen many, many times. Um, I wonder how that would change if I stopped midway and go, hey, you know what, I, would you mind if I just recorded this? Yeah, I, I would say on the gear thing, though, as well, is something I've learned for sure is you, you're right, I wouldn't go with with the wrong equipment. But I've also worked out that I need a lot less than I think. Yeah. And I can, I, I would rather, like when I went to film with Jack recently, um, you know, I pitched up at this lifeboat station and I just had um, an, a Sony a7 III mm-hmm. with a Tamron 28 to 75 lens on it, 2.8, little plastic thing. It's really like a very cheap, affordable zoom lens. And I've got a, a Pro Mist and a, and, a, and a variable ND on the front. And that's, I'm just running and gunning, holding that. He's and like, what oh, did you use for your here? audio? What, because your no audio, audio. Is, say again? No audio, no audio on that day at all. That's just B-roll. Oh, it was so just a B-roll. The okay. interview, when I do the interview, I will set up two cameras on tripods and a light. But again, I've, I've worked to keep that gear very small as well in terms of interview. But everything else I do is, is one camera, one lens is all the interesting footage you see in those films something that I could fit in a little sling bag around me. And I love yeah. working like that. You know, I put the drones away. You know, does a drone shot really add to the story? If it does, I'll take it out. But it very rarely does. <laughs> it depends does. on who you are. You know? Yeah, yeah, well. That's Sometimes true. the drone shot <laughs> is the story. <laughs> Sometimes it is the story. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, do I really need to take the GoPro out? Probably right. not. Leave it in the bag. Like, do I need to have six different lenses with super shallow depth of field? Does it add to the story? No, it doesn't. It definitely yeah. doesn't. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. just gets distracting. Like, shoot good shots well composed that give the narrative and and be able to move freer and and easier and 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 with less stuff around that actually does distract people when you're trying to capture them make it as easy for them and for you as you possibly can because you'll get better stuff and there's definitely an audio version of that yeah you know? well, what is what, you told me one time what does neil use cuz his his audio always sounds good oh yeah He's just got a he's just got a uh, a shotgun mic with a dead cat on it with a with a handle grip that's just uh, XLR'd into a Zoom H4. That's it. That's it. Wow. Okay. That's it. And then he passes that between you. It's not two mics. He just he just holds it to himself like interviewer style. Holds it to himself, talks into it, holds it to you, to, and and you talk into it, and just backwards and forwards like that. That's how he. Well, certainly when when he came and interviewed me a few years ago, that's how he did that, and and that couldn't be easier because we went on a walk around the park. 
He's like, let's let's do this section, just go for a walk and do it. And we went and walked and talked while while we were walking around. Then we got back home. He's like, oh, let's just sit on the couch here. Are you comfortable? Yeah, let's go. Let's just keep talking. And it was so the gear wasn't in the way. You know, it wasn't the quality's great. And you've you've got that gear already. You know, yeah. The, yeah. the the, the quality's plenty, plenty good and way better than other walk and talk stuff you hear already. And you've you've got enough to do that. And and it's not in the way. It's not a lot of stuff. It's yeah. just it's just the right amount of stuff that you can be incredibly mobile and respond to the situation and not make someone feel too much kind of under the lights, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's what I want. I don't want to, to, you know, I know people who have like the little, uh, the road, um, oh, what, what the ones that we were looking at, the little, the little clip on ones that record. Oh, yeah. 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 The road mic. Whatever uh, they are, yeah. I don't, road, I don't yeah. want to do that. I don't want to lav somebody up. I want to make it yeah. as seamless as possible. I want it to be the difference between shooting with, Shooting a portrait of someone with a big DSLR and a light and your Rico. Yes. I yeah. want the audio yeah. equivalent of that distinction. Yeah. And I reckon those little H4s are enough for that. I mean, they're, they're amazing quality out of those yeah. things. I've got an yeah. H5 that I've been using for years. So beautiful. You know, shotgun mic. And I think maybe it's there. Maybe we're there. I, honestly, I, th- I think that's more than you need. I mean, most, most like, that's more than most journalists use. I know films that are shot on that gear. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it sounds great. Mm-hmm. No, no issue with those. Yeah, I think it's good, and it's just keeping it out the way, isn't it? And and because, because it's about the interaction stuff. It's what I, it's what I got from Jack about his photography process was the reason he chose that process was he gets good interactions with people. Right. I, it's why I use the one camera, one lens setup when I do B roll, so I can get good interaction with people and let them be in their environment as comfortably as possible without me sort of setting up tripods and sliders and lights and asking them to do things 20 times. It's like, look, I'm going to get what I'm going to get. I could probably get better shots if I drag this out for hours and got you to do things 20 times, but I want to give us a good experience together and get honest moments from you rather than super prepared moments that you might want to lick the screen because it looks so sexy. That's not what I'm after. (laughs) I'm after the, I'd rather, I'd rather, you know what I mean? I'd rather make a, I'd rather make a run and gun, dock with some soul to it than right. something that's got super slick production value it's why i love Werner herzog's documentaries because he just goes with his cameraman peter zeitlinger and he's the director and they're a two-man crew and he does his own audio Werner herzog captures the audio and mm. they just run around and film stuff they think will work for it like yeah. the cinematography is not the best in his documentaries there's definitely like sexier looking docs but but they've got so much soul in them and there's something so interesting and quirky and, and agile about them that I, I want to be that. That's right. more interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is all really good. Really good. I'm excited for you to do it, man. I think, I think it's going to be, I think all you, of you, this is fantastic. Yeah. And you what? Sorry, go ahead. Well, you've just got the right heroes for, what I was going to say you've got, I mean, you've got Suds Turkle as someone who did this for how long, you know, like, he he's paved the way for you to do this kind of work. And now it's easier than ever. Your gear is already much better than what he was using. Way yeah. Better. I don't, I don't have to lug around a big reel to reel recorder. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, the, the sound quality you're going to get out of yours is, would blow his out the water. And yet yeah. you love his work because there's nothing to do with that. Even though your sound quality will be 10 times better. It's, it's, it's the soul of what he put into it and the interactions he had with people that you have in spades that's going to make the difference. That's going to make the work yeah. like compelling to listen to. He was just a master at making room. He was a, a, a master at making space. And there was no, there was no hierarchy between him and his guest. It mm-hmm. was just two people having a conversation, regardless of what you did for a living, who you were in the public eye, didn't matter. You were just two people having a conversation. Yeah. Kind of like this. Subscribe to Jeffrey Sidoris Everything in your favorite podcast app and support the show by leaving a review or a rating wherever you listen or by sharing the episode on social media. You can help support what I do more directly by tapping the donate button at jeffreysedoris.com. That's J-E-F-F-E-R-Y-S-A-D-D-O-R-I-S. And thank you very much to those of you who have done that. Connect with Sean on Twitter and Instagram at Sean Tuck. That's S-E-A-N-T-U-C-K on his website at seantucker.photography or by searching for Sean Tucker on YouTube. Connect with me on Twitter and Instagram at Jeffrey Sidoris. 
And you can connect with both of us by sending an email or a voice message to deepnatter at gmail.com. And as always, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it, and we hope you'll come back for the next one. Thank you.